Hi, I'm Charles with Annie Cat. Previously, Kotoko would come to know that her longtime crush, Kuro, had broken up with his girlfriend. She starts to involve herself with him revealing her powers and abilities as the goddess of wisdom. Kuro himself had some secrets to share regarding his ability to heal himself and kill yokai. Soon after, Kotoko found herself fending off a spirit, protecting Kuro's ex-girlfriend Saki without realizing it was her. The story continues as Saki takes Kotoko back to her apartment and patches up her minor injuries. She points out immediately that Kotoko lied about being Kuro's girlfriend as she isn't his type at all. Saki begins to wonder if the death of Kuro's cousin had anything to do with him involving himself with a girl like Kotoko. Since Saki is dealing with the person experienced in the supernatural, she finds it easy to say that her marriage with Kuro broke down because she never considered the possibility of him being inhuman. This leads Kotoko to say that she is the perfect match for him, being sort of like a priestess who can mediate from demons and spirits. They start to look into the actual business, talking about how violent Steel Lady Nanase was. It was apparent that if they left the ghost without doing anything, it'd soon commit murder or something worse on that level. Saki asks her why Kuro was not with her since hunting something like the Steel Lady is a dangerous job and he would be perfect for it. She tries to lie about him not feeling well, but Saki catches on, causing her to reveal that Kuro had been missing for some time. She shows her the last text sent by him where he mentioned having something to do and for her to stop looking for him. Saki is surprised to know that Kotoko still liked and cared for Kuro despite knowing his condition, making her wonder why she could not do the same. Their discussions come to an end and Saki boards her escort, which is a large skeleton spirit towering over the town buildings. Saki takes the time to research Nanase Karen who is known for her gifted physical appearance and a breakout role in a TV show. This piques her interest as Saki came to realize that despite all this, she never evolved from being an idol and only had a cult fan following. Her investigation brings her to a shady site that mentioned the darker details of her downfall. It started with her father dying in June last year, which would severely affect Nanase's career. Rumors began to circulate that it was Nanase who killed her own father out of resentment. A note was found where her father clearly mentioned his daughter was acting as if she would kill him. These rumors would push her to Makurazaka City, the same place where death would find her after a few days. She takes all this info to her senior, trying to convince them and herself about the fact that they really were dealing with an evil spirit. He points out a crucial point, saying that if Nanase was a vengeful spirit, she wouldn't be targeting random masses like she has been. On the other hand, Kotoko had her own investigation going. She also begins to recall the events, realizing that despite being a spirit, Nanase felt like a hollow puppet to her, with no motive, powers, or presence. She then comes across the same shady site that Saki visited a while ago, where the illustration of Steel Lady Nanase is too uncanny for her not to notice. Saki took upon the investigation papers her senior provided, finding out that Nanase's accidental death was a gruesome one. She found it odd that confirmations regarding this case took so long despite it being a clear accident. She begins to think about the bizarre statement Nanase's older sister made, but before she can think about it, she feels a presence behind her windows. Saki moves in front of the curtains, afraid to open them, fearing the steel lady would be there. She does open it eventually, only to a harmless looking yokai just hovering there. Despite its appearance, Saki is still very much afraid of it as it starts to hover towards her. The yokai introduces himself as an acquaintance of Kotoko, who was sent to ask for Saki's assistance regarding the steel lady case. Upon getting confirmation that Saki had agreed to help, Kotoko hurries to the nearest place she was last seen. She rides her bicycle but stops midway after seeing Kuro battle it out with the Steel Lady herself. She hides beside a vending machine and carefully observes the battle, wondering what Kuro was doing there. While she is looking, it doesn't seem like Kuro even knows how to fight, and she starts to wonder what an amateur he is. Saki arrives right behind her and points out that they should probably do something to save him. She's still very worried but Kotoko comforts her as the difference in strength between Kuro and Steel Lady isn't really that big. The fight is rather one-sided and Kuro gets his head bashed in after being cornered. Saki watches in horror as she begins to recall the time he cut his fingers and they healed in an instant, giving her the shivers. Saki then talks about how unfair it was for her to be in that relationship and how Kuro was the only one living a decent life with no care whatsoever. In light of what she said, Kuro then regrows his head back and is completely unscathed. This time he approaches the lady and easily grabs her by the neck, predicting her move like he knew it was going to happen. Saki is confused and Kotoko tells her that eating a yokai and a mermaid gave him a bunch of different powers including the ability to determine the future. We then see a backstory of Kuran, the yokai that Kuro had eaten. It had the head of a man and a body of a cow. Years ago, the members of the Sakuragawa family got their hands on Kuran's flesh, eating it in the hopes of gaining prophetic powers. Most of them died instantly after having a bad reaction to the meat whereas others died a slow and painful death. 
The head of the family then realized that a person would need to have an immortal body to withstand the backlashes of eating Kuran's flesh. Even this experiment would eventually fail until the time Kuro was born into the family. The head members once again tried to feed mermaid meat to the kids without telling them that it was in the dinner. All of the kids would immediately cough blood and die, except for Kuro, who seemed to not react to it. The experiment was a success and his family then tried different methods to kill him just to be sure. With the story still being told, Kuro is still struggling with the steel lady. She damages him even under his control, but things finally end when he pins her down and snaps her neck. It still isn't enough to kill the ghost as she stands right back up and puts her neck back into place. Seeing this much is enough for Kotoko to realize that normal methods would not work and that they have to try a different strategy. Kuro then heads to greet Saki as both of them get awkward with each other. He apologizes on behalf of Kotoko, even recognizing her as his current girlfriend. Despite this, Kuro and Saki start to blush while talking to each other and Kotoko takes him away in jealousy. They still head back to Saki's apartment and Kotoko is constantly bothered by the fact that Kuro is looking at Saki. He then tells her that he came to the city after getting a call but did not expect to see the steel lady there. He only came to know of danger after seeing a bunch of injured and shaken up spirits on his way. He mentions how it was surprising to know that Steel Lady did not fear him at all, as most spirits would usually run away from him or find him terrifying. Kotoko adds that Steel Lady herself is a monster manifested from the delusions and desires of regular humans. She explains that just talking about ghosts in general is harmless and common for people to do. But when people start to give that legend or story a name, then the emotions and delusions accumulate, giving birth to the very monster in the process. It still didn't make sense though for that newborn spirit to be so similar and powerful as her human counterpart. This is when Kotoko points out the shady website from earlier that had much darker and more real information regarding the Steel Lady. She explains that the very existence of such a strong media outlet was enough for the Steel Lady to manifest a large amount of power. In short, whoever ran the website was the real culprit in this case. They do manage to figure out this much, but the question of defeating her still remains. Kuro's rather pessimistic about it because he found her to be a lot stronger than he expected. Kotoko then clarifies that if imagination is what made her powerful, then they will just have to counter that imagination altogether. She hopes to get some valid information regarding Nanase's death, wanting Saki to help her get all that. The plan is to then use that information to create a new story of a rumor that will completely overlook the current one, the one that has been powering Steel Lady. This new rumor will aim to paint the idea in people's brains that a ghost called Steel Lady Nanase does not exist. Deviating the attention from the spirit will automatically seal its defeat, or at least that is what Kotoko wants to achieve. Saki is a bit hesitant about giving her inside information regarding Nanase's death, but she then helps herself with the documents Saki was hiding under her bed. She does agree to help in this plan, but isn't very happy with the idea that they might potentially frame a person for something that isn't even natural. Kotoko further clarifies saying police will not have to be involved in this at all as the core concept is to win over the people, not the spirit or the supposed culprit. As such, Saki begins to intricately recall the details of Nanase's death, talking about the unusual way she died, and what a 19 year old girl was doing at a construction site in the middle of the night. They come to the logical explanation that someone had called her there to meet. Things get a little shaky here as they had also found some cigarettes near the site making them wonder if it was Nanase who smoked them. This also brought the possibility that her acquaintance was already present and was smoking. The details start to get even vaguer when they come to the accident itself. It was reported that while she was smoking there and waiting, the steel beams would abruptly fall on top of her, killing her in an instant. This was suspicious because there were no signs of struggle or self-defense from Nanase, even if it had happened so fast. Saki points out that even if a person knew it was useless, the reflexes would still kick in in response to self-defense. In Nanase's case, she just let herself be crushed completely without even trying to resist. They then looked into the possibility of Nanase simply not caring about her death at all. Her reputation as a fugitive had pushed her into this city. Despite being an idol, Nanase was forced to hide from the media most of the time while having to cope with their rumors. As such, when the steel beams fell, she did not find it in her to move away. When talking about possible culprits, Saki brings up the name of Nanase Karen's older sister, Nanase Hatsumi. She was one of the prime suspects in her sister's death, but had a strong alibi that helped her escape it. During a police interrogation, Hatsumi had also mentioned that her sister was not in a suicidal state, which would ultimately point more fingers at her as Hatsumi was said to be her sister's only inheritor. 
things still didn't clear up, so they then head to the scene of the crime itself in hopes of finding a witness. Kotoko is well aware that no one was there at the time of her death, and so they will need help of something inhuman. She does a small dance and summons the spirit of a construction worker. Luckily, he was there the night Nanase died and starts to remember the events, even sympathizing with the victim as he talked. Much like they predicted, the spirit would go on to say the same thing. The seal beams fell on her and she openly let them crush her, basically killing herself in the process. Although the truth is now out in the open, Saki is skeptical of how Kotoko would make it work. She points out that people are not always interested in the truth, and some of them deliberately concern themselves with the supernatural for amusement. Kuro and Kotoko then head their own way, leaving Saki on the note that this plan will definitely work one way or the other. The main key is for Kuro to die and look into the future as much as he can since he can afford it thanks to his supernatural body. He explains that no matter what, the future will always split into endless possibilities, as literally anything can happen at any given moment. But the powers of Kuron allow him to accumulate those infinite paths into one. His powers still have a limit as he can only accumulate those paths that have a high probability of happening, meaning even his prediction of the future isn't completely without flaw. Elsewhere, Saki's senior officer Tarada, who was following his own leads, finally comes across the Steel Lady. Thanks for watching part 2, all other parts will be in a pinned comment below.